Did you hear anything at all, Patty, when I first came on here? Um, I can't hear anything. <laughs> so that sucks. But hopefully I'm not like glitching it or anything and everything's okay. Hey, Mama 3. So is everything okay? Like the picture's there. I'm not glitching out. You guys can see me. It's not shit. <laughs> Hey, autistic. You can hear me. I just couldn't hear the intro. Could you guys hear the intro? Oh, good. I hope everything's good. Hey, SD. Sweet. Okay, so I was thinking, um, just because I'm, um, there was no intro. Oh. Hey, Albert and Stella. I hope you're feeling better. You didn't hear the intro. Did you hear that at all? I couldn't hear it either. Weird. I'll have to fix that somehow. I don't know. I can't remember what I was going to say now. Oh, yeah, about this book. So the book that we're reading here, The Black Dahlia, I like really, really, you did hear that? Okay. So I just can't hear it on my end for some reason. Hmm. Whatever, I'll figure it out later. So because of this book, um, I'm like obsessed with it. I really, 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 really love books like this because they give you all the details and stuff that you've never even heard. I never even knew. And then there's pictures and stuff in here that I haven't even seen anywhere. So I'm like obsessed with it. So instead of waiting for every Thursday, I'm thinking we should do every Thursday and Sunday <laughs> just because I want to um I don't know I feel like a week is a really long time because by the time we get back into the book again it's like I have to do a review of it you know what I mean might be okay if we um do it every yeah oh you think YouTube is either turned off intros or they're having issues you're not alone it's happening oh phew yay it's not me this new computer is awesome then. It better be. Because it's about... I ain't going to tell you. <laughs> I have to pay for it monthly. So luckily there is... Um, there was that option. Amazon's great for that. I definitely needed a new laptop. I got it in two days. And I just pay for it monthly. For a full year. And then I own it. It's working great. Good. I like it. It's really cute. Um, everything's pink as usual. <laughs> you hear my son all right so i'll get started <laughs> hold on a minute I don't know what he's doing. I'm like, can you shut it? I'm live. He's like, shorty, shorty. Oh, yep. Shorty. You're like, no, I'm live. Oh, you're live. Yeah. So shut it. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get started. Here's the front of it. I can't remember if I showed you it or not. Mm -hmm. Um, I posted also, you need my address. Um, I have you on Twitter, right? Just message me on Twitter so I won't forget. Um, on my community tab, I did put the photos from the first two chapters that I read. Uh, there's a bunch of them, so you guys can look at them. You will need a mag like a magnifying glass, I think, because there is printing that's really small in some of these. So, <clears throat> all right. So now we're on chapter three. This is really cool, though, with all the mob in it, um, like Bugsy. I thought that was pretty neat. All right, so chapter three is AKA the Black Dahlia. 
Although we had moved north to the land of the majors, my stepfather, Jerry Bernard, was a producer at Monogram Pictures, which cranked out Bowery Boys movies, Charlie Chan's, and cheap B-Westerns on Hollywood's Poverty Row. It took me a while to accept Jeff as my stepfather, but in time I grew to understand and greatly admire him. However, it was a long time before I was able to decipher the puzzling monogram anagram, which had to do with the mob, money, and movies. Yeah, I'll forget too. So just, oh, I think that was you. Oop. Yep. All right, I will check this when we're done. I didn't fully realize at the time, but the mob was entrenched in a number of Hollywood enterprises. In the days of prohibition, bootleggers were making so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. Hollywood was a natural draw for the mob and syndicate money was often placed in film in the film industry where the underworld was connected to Joe Schneck, Schneck? I think so. chairman of the 20th Century Fox and his brother Nicholas, who was an executive at Lowe's Incorporated, the parent company of MGM. Uh, Republic Pictures was founded with syndicate funds, and Harry Cohn, the president of Columbia Pictures, was often bailed out of financial difficulties by the mafioso Johnny Rosalie, who was once Cohn's bodyguard. I never some mono monogram films. Hmm. Part of that, like. The 20th Century Fox in Columbia and MGM, but not that one. So Monogram Pictures was a syndicate money laundering operation. Oh, nice. Founded in 1925 by former bootlegger Joseph P. Kennedy. The studio was aptly incorporated under the name of Syndicate Pictures, but the name was changed to Monogram, Monogram Pictures in 1930. When the syndicate connotation became un unproprietous, while well, many independents on Poverty Row went bankrupt after several films, films, those with business acumen observed monogram staying power with wonderment. The studio, which was located near the junction of Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard, kept grinding our low-budget celluloid schlock for three decades from 1925 to 1955. Rest in peace. Hey, Melanie, did you get um, an actual notification? That would be nice if they start working again. During the 1940s, uh, Jack Dragna, Johnny Rosalie, Bugsy Siegel, and Mickey Cohen were the mafia bosses and syndicate chiefs in Los Angeles. At the time, many people were under the impression that Bugsy's mistress, Virginia Sugar Hill, was just another voluptuous girlfriend. She was known around Hollywood for throwing lavish nightclub parties and tipping waiters and maitre d's with $50 bills. Hill was referred to in the gossip column as Southern Heiress. However, Virginia was the cash courier and money laundress for the syndicate. She traveled from city to city using various aliases as she collected and, distri and distributed laundered cash for Joseph Joey e. Epstein, Joey Epstein, the mob's trusted ex-checker in Chicago. I wonder if he's uh, any relation to um, the other Epstein. You didn't get one? Well, that sucks. I was going to say, is that is that a Kennedy, like a Kennedy Kenny? President Kennedy's father, Joe, had ties to the mob. Sure. Oh, I wouldn't doubt it. Hey, Jen with no filter. Hey, Jen with no filter. That's good. I lost my spot. <laughs> Some of the mob money out of New York was laundered through the club, which was an affiliation of Frank Costello and other syndicate investors who held their ill-gotten gains in a fund at Morgan Guarantee Bank in New York City. Money from the club was often distributed to George Burroughs, the vice president and treasurer of Monogram, who was an old crony of Joe Kennedy's. Wow. See, these are interesting. I don't, um, like a lot of the stuff I didn't know. But, like, I was reading with the Black Dahlia, um, just a couple things, like, not a whole book or anything, but um, I've always heard that the mob was involved with this. Like, it was, the police were involved, everybody was, like, involved, you know what I mean? I always did hear that, like, it was a huge cover-up or something. 
Johnny Rosalie, who had been a friend of Kennedy's, going back to their early days together in Hollywood, became an associate producer of Monogram on several films. And one of the studio's more successful pictures in the 1940s was Dillinger, which was produced by the King Brothers, a family of Hollywood gangsters who made the film as a tribute to one of their fallen idols. My stepfather, Jeff, was the odd man out at Monogram, Monogram, sorry, where everyone seemed to speak out of the corner of their mouths with either a Bostonian East Stock accent or a Western twang. Jeff was a highly sophisticated British gentleman who had been an important figure in the London film industry prior to World War II. As the vice president and executive in charge of production at Galmont British Studios, he had taken Alfred Hitch Hitchcock out of the cutting rooms and made him a director. This author, like, and family ties to everything. That's amazing, but scary at the same time. Um, as a vice president and executive in charge of production at uh, Galmont British Studios, he had taken, I just said that, sorry. It was at Galmont British that Jeff was the executive producer of such cinema classics as The Lady Vanishes, The 39 Steps, and Pastor Hall. Do you guys know any of those movies? I haven't heard of them. When the former bootlegger, Joseph P. Kennedy, okay, so that was the father you were saying, right? Joe Kennedy was the president. Okay, so he was a bootlegger. <laughs> nice. When the former bootlegger, <laughs> Joe Kennedy, was appointed ambassador to England and moved to London in 1937, Jeff became a social acquaintance, both were members of London's Screen Golfing Society and mutual admirers of Constance Bennett who appeared in several of Jeff's Gaumont British films. It was through Joe Kennedy that Jeff ultimately became producer at Monogram, where he lent the studio an air of respectability while producing some ec excellent program pictures that actually made some money. Yeah, I haven't heard of it either. Hollywood mafioso Johnny Roselli, along with the studio's vice president and treasurer, George Burroughs, were occasionally guests at our home. My mother knew that Bugsy Siegel was a gangster and she wouldn't allow him in our house. <laughs> yeah. 30s and 40s. Yeah, I don't know. I know Alfred Hitchcock. I think we all do, but not the other names of those movies. Not at all. Like 39 Steps, The Lady Vanishes, and Pastor Hall. I've never heard of it. <clears throat> My mother knew that Bugsy was a gangster and she wouldn't allow him in her house. But we first learned that Rosalie was a mafia figure when he was indicated along with Willie Byoff and Joe uh, Shinek for racketeering and extortion. The story of how Rosalie had been receiving protection money from the major studios made the front pages of the L.A. newspaper in 1943. And Rosalie's story was hard to miss because Jeff liked to keep up with all the latest Hollywood news and gossip. We subscribed to all of the major metropolitan newspapers, including the Los Angeles Times and the Hearst Publications, the Evening Herald, and the Examiner. Shortly before the Black Dahlia case made the headlines, there had been a number of front page stories concerning Los Angeles gang warfare, numerous shootings, bombings, and attempted assassinations that culminated in Bugsy Siegel's murder just five months following the murder of Elizabeth Short. The mob warfare stories would break and soon fade, but the Dahlia murder case appeared above the fold on the front pages every day for more than a month. There was an element to the Dahlia case that made it unique to its time and its place. Somehow, the gruesome crime could not have occurred in any other era or any other place. The Black Dahlia murder uniquely belonged to the post-war months on the mob-ridden streets in the land of sunshine and shadows, Los Angeles, 1947. When the Los Angeles Examiner identified the victim as Elizabeth Short, editor Jim Richardson sent Will Fowler to Santa Barbara to find out more about her and find out more about her 1943 arrest. The Santa Barbara Police Department's desk sergeant handed Fowler the arrest record, which indicated that Elizabeth Short had been sent back home as a juvenile delinquent to her mother, Phoebe Short, who lived in Medford, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. Included in the arrest record was mug shots taken when she was booked. Father recalled being struck by Elizabeth's short eyes. What are shorts? Oh, 
sorry, he was struck by her eyes, which had a vacant fatalistic stare, yet reflected a sort of inquisitive innocence. Fowler observed. Her skin looked as though it had the quality of an alabaster. Her dark curly hair loosely draping this inculpable stare suggested she might have been a beautiful woman. The Examiner headline story of Friday, January 17th included the Santa Barbara police photos in an interview with Santa Barbara policewoman Mary H. Unikfer? Unkefer. Unkefer. Something like that. Juvenile officer Unkefer had been uh, called into the 1943 case when Elizabeth Short was arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct and was at end of, uh, identified as a minor. She is gorgeous. Here's I'll put these in the community tab as well as we go along. I'll put the photos in, but this is her. I hate trying to do this. I suck at it. Yeah, I suck at it, but yeah. I'll put them in the community tab so you guys can see them. She was living in a bungalow court with Vera Green. Officer Uncover called, recalled. There were four soldiers from Camp Cook in their cottage when they were arrested. The Santa Barbara cottage was at 3321 C, West, I don't even know how to say that street name. Montecito, I think it is. Montecito Street? And the neighbors had complained about wild parties. It was obvious to the arresting officers that the soldiers were staying there over the weekend with the girls and that a good deal of drinking was going on. Miss Green claimed that one of the soldiers found in her bedroom was her husband. Officer Uncover recalled, but we later learned her husband was a soldier overseas. While Miss Short was awaiting action on the juvenile probation and investigation, I took her into my home. She was a very nice girl and was most neat about her personal about her person and clothes. The juvenile court released her on probation finally, and I took her to a bus on which she started back to Massachusetts. The Santa Barbara neighborhood house gave her $10 for expense money. Can you imagine $10? That's all you got, like right now? Whoa, you'd never make it. The examiner's story pointed out that Officer Uncover revealed Miss Short had a rose tattoo on her leg. She loved to sit so that it would show, Uncover recalled. The article went on to note that the murderer had mutilated her left leg, removing this identifying mark. The examiner's story of January 17th also included a significant observation that has eluded the scrutiny of investigative journalists for more than half a century. She had the blackest hair I ever saw, Miss Uncover recalled yesterday. At the time of her death, the girl's hair was, I don't know what that means. Henade, Henade, I don't even know what that means. But the original dark strands were beginning to regrow. Like fade, maybe? Henna is a, oh, never mind. Henna is a reddish hair dye made from a tropical plant that was popular at the time. Never mind, I just answered my own question. Okay, so she had the blackest hair I ever saw. Miss Uncover recalled yesterday, at the time of her death, the girl's hair had that henna in it, which is a reddish hair dye. Okay. Uh, but everyone who knew Elizabeth Sharp prior to her disappearance and murder could only recall her as having jet black hair. Will Fowler recalled that the corpse had reddish brown hair, and the Jane Doe description at the morgue noted that her hair was hennaed. That's it. Dyed? Yeah. See, I didn't know that either, that her hair was dyed. I had no idea. If the examiner was correct in stating that the original dark strands were beginning to regrow, then it can be assumed that the hair was dyed at least a week or two prior to her death, which would indicate that she had tried to change her appearance shortly before she was murdered. It was also observed that bleach had been applied to her eyebrows. I didn't know that either. When Will Fowler returned to the Examiner City room with copies of the Santa Barbara photos and arrest record, Richardson's assigned rewrite man, Wayne Sutton, to locate Elizabeth Short's mother. Sutton obtained Phoebe Short's home phone number from Medford Information, and in an unholy gambit, Richardson told Sutton not to break the news about her daughter's murder until he had obtained as much background information as possible. That sounds kind of uh, asshole-ish. She has a right to know, like right away. 
Don't tell her right out, Richardson instructed. First say Elizabeth won a beauty contest in Santa Barbara. Get what we need in background. I'll give you the sign when to tell her her daughter's dead. That's fucked up. Leave henna on you. Use henna on your eyebrows. Works like a dream, but it can make a mess. I didn't even know. When I think of henna, I think of like the dye that they use um, to make those tattoos all over your body and stuff like that. asshole i'll give you the sign when i tell her, her daughter's dead just because you want background information i tell lie and say she won a beauty contest that's wow richardson listened in on an extension line as sutton dutifully dialed the long distance number you're tempted to shave them off why it's power in the water oh it's the same stuff oh, okay Hello, Sutton said. Miss Phoebe Short? Hey, Miss Short, this is Wayne Sutton on the Los Angeles Examiner. I called to tell you. Sutton stammered as he looked to Richardson, who impatiently motioned for him to continue. I just wanted to be the first to tell you that your daughter Elizabeth has won a beauty contest in Santa Barbara. Sutton recalled that Phoebe was overjoyed to hear the good news about her daughter and went on and on about Betty's special beauty and charm and that she had won other beauty contests as well, including one in Medford. Stricken by what he was doing, Sutton glared at Richardson, cupped his hands over the phone and said, you lousy son of a bitch. But Richardson just leaned over in his chair as he listened intently on the extension and mouthed the words, keep going. I would have threw the fucking phone at him, said, you keep going. You do it. What am I doing your dirty work? The hell with that. Phoebe told Sutton that many men found Betty to be attractive and commented on a letter she had only recently received from her daughter, dated January 8, 1947. It had been written while visiting friends in San Diego, she said, and indicated that she was returning to Los Angeles with a gentleman, Betty referred to as Red. Get the San Diego address, Richardson urgently whispered. When Sutton obtained the return address on Elizabeth's letter from San Diego, Richardson finally gave the sign and whispered, now it was time for Sutton to tell Miss Short the ghastly truth that her daughter had been brutally murdered. That is horrible. The kitchen? <laughs> that or the phone booth, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he told all three of them, both of us, yeah, all three of us were like, seeing the same thing. fucked up so get the most information you can off this woman then let her know that her her daughter's been brutally murdered i can't like really after breaking the tragic news sutton recalled that mrs short stayed on the line mostly because she was hoping there was some mistake that it was not really her daughter and because she wanted to know exactly what happened the kitchen Sutton tried to enlist her cooperation, telling her that the examiner would pay her airfare and arrange accommodations if she would fly to Los Angeles for the inquest, which had been scheduled for Wednesday, January 22nd. Would you guys not freak out? I would flip the hell out if that was me and these police officers are telling me that my daughter won a beauty contest when in actuality she was brutally, brutally murdered. I would freak the fuck out, like, bad. Like, th that pisses me off. They thought she was a streetwalker and of no value, apparently. Yeah, I remember hearing that, too. Like, it hasn't stated that quite yet right now. It's a human being. But I know, it's the same shit, different story in Canada. Even so, with Indigenous women gone missing. They just don't care. Like, they literally waited till 2017 to put some sort of transportation on the Highway of Tears. To Richardson's delight, Phoebe Short agreed to the examiner's offer. I didn't know for um, newspaper companies to pay for plane tickets for somebody. But okay. In the hope of being able to help in some way. So 
Elizabeth Short's mom, Phoebe, decided to go. But Richardson's ruthless gambit was to keep the murder victim's mother in seclusion and away from the police and rival reporters long enough to pump her for additional information. You're gonna, every time you, I hear food, now I'm hungry again. I'm not starving, though, because I did just kind of eat. <laughs> that sounds so bad. In the meantime, Richardson, who was on to another scoop, an address in San Diego where Elizabeth Short had been staying only a week before her body was discovered, and the fact that she planned to leave San Diego with a gentleman she referred to as Red. Sutton recalled that Richardson had absolutely no intention of sharing the San Diego leads with Captain Donahoe, not until the examiner had a chance to track down the mysterious man called Red. What? By the time Sutton concluded his conversation with the victim's mother and hung up the phone, Richardson had already assigned reporters Tom Devlin, George O'Day, to head south immediately to San Diego, find out where she was staying, and get an ID on Red. You only had chocolate and ice. Oh my gosh, well, you're going to turn into chocolate. Reporters working for Richardson were known to be on assignment for 72 hours straight, keeping themselves awake on benzedrine before turning in their story and collapsing in Morin's bar across the street from the examiner, while Will Fowler could often be found nursing his exhaustion while Richardson skated around the city room. These guys are punk assholes. Little punks. William Rudolph Fowler was named after William Rudolph Hearst by his father, Gene Fowler, the notable author and journalist. Will's father had worked for Hearst in the 1920s on Park Row, where he was the managing editor of the New York Daily American. The family moved to Southern California in 1935, when Gene Fowler became, Fowler became a prominent screenwriter in the 20th at 20th Century Fox. Graduating from Beverly Hills High School in 1940, Will served in the Coast Guard during the war before joining the Examiner in 1945 at the age of 22. I thought that was a powerful drug. As a young man, Will hung around with such notable family friends as John Barrymore, W.C. Fields, who was in his god, who was his godfather, and the prominent author and screenwriter Ben Hetched. So Ben, who had been a crime reporter for the Hearst newspaper in Chicago, once said, "A Hearst newspaper is like a screaming woman running down the street with her throat cut." While the Hearst newspapers were known for yellow journalism and took the sensational quick nickel approach to the news, the Daily was more liberal. You didn't have any for three days? Oh, no. <laughs> Originally founded in 1923 by Cornelius Vanderblit, built Jr. as a penny. Family newspaper that avoided scandal and sensationalism. The Daily News was taken over by Manchester Body in 1932. The paper endorsed Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Deal and for decades remained the only liberal voice among the Los Angeles Metropolitan Papers. Located at Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles Street, the Daily News did not have the large staff of the Los Angeles Times or the Hearst Papers. While the Examiner had a dozen reporters working the Black Dahlia story, the Daily News only had two, and the city desk was starved starving for copy. Roy Ringer was a new office employee at the Daily News when the Black Dahlia story broke. He recalled that the Daily News was getting hammered by Richardson and the examiner scoops. Because Ringer was new on the job and unknown to rival reporters, the Daily News city desk sent him over to the examiner on a spy mission. Ringer recalled that he casually walked into the nearby examiner's building and entered the composing room. Where he spotted the Dahlia story proofs hanging on spikes for the copy boys. He began filching one copy of the proofs each day and racing back to the Daily News desk, where the Dahlia news story would be rewritten and often out on the street before the examiner. On the fourth day of the enterprising news gathering from the examiner spikes, he felt a hand clamp down on his shoulder. It was Richardson. Nice try, he scowled, as Ringer was kicked out of the building and told not to come back. 
The Los Angeles Times was the more conservative of the metropolitan papers. I did not engage in the lurid sens sensationalism of the Hearst papers, nor did it care to lead an active investigation into the murder of Elizabeth Short. These newspaper companies and all that must have something to do with this too, because it's a lot of talk about these newspapers. And I don't really care about it, but I'm assuming it means something. The Times had been owned and operated by the Chandler dynasty since the 1880s and under the family's inflexible patriarch, Harry Chandler, and dynasty literally ran the city, making appointments to the Chamber of Commerce and nominating and seeing to the election of mayors and appointments of police sher chiefs, sheriffs, and city commissioners during the first half of the 20th century. The Chandlers were the dominant political and social voice of Southern California, and they spoke through the Los Angeles Times. Candidates for political office in Los Angeles knew that the support of Harry Chandler and the Times were, was a prerequisite if they expected to win. No mayor could possibly be elected unless he was a Chandler's choice. And as insurance, Chandler always made sure he had a majority of the 15 city councilmen in his back pocket. A city council majority could always override an uncooperative mayor. While the mayor's office and the city council were Chandler's central power hold on the city, full control of the Los Angeles depended on domination of the police department. Chandler accomplished this through the five-member police commission, and it was Chandler's man, the mayor, who appointed the police commissioners. Chandler only needed three commissioners for a majority, but he usually controlled all five. Therefore, Chandler controlled the LAPD. It was the police commission that appointed the police chief and Chief Clements B. Horrell had been Chandler's choice. Although it was common knowledge on the top floors of the city hall that the upper echelons of the police department and the mayor's office were receiving payoffs from Bugsy Siegel, Jack Dragna, and the underworld. This was something that did not concern Chandler as long as discretion was employed. Both William Randolph Hearst and Harry Chandler had relied on the Red Squad within the LAPD to break the labor strikes that often plagued newspapers the studios, and major city industries. And the Red Squad had often recruited goons from the underworld who were known to threaten, kidnap, and beat troublesome labor leaders. As additional insurance that he had control of the police department, Chandler circumvented the city charter provisions and had Mayor Boron point an assistant police chief. Prior to 1939, there had never been an assistant police chief in Los Angeles. Huh. But at the behest of Harry Chandler, Boron appointed Chandler aide Joe Reed as assistant chief to Clarence B. Horrell. Reed was placed in power over the heads of the police inspectors and deputy chiefs who would have been rightfully entitled to the newly designated position. Reed was Chandler's key operative within the department, reporting back to Chandler at the liaison with Horrell. Reed remained the Chandler overseer of the LAPD until he resigned in a cloud of scandal in 1949. With the death of Harley Chandler in 1944, his son Norman became the mogul heir apparent. A handsome debonair man of 43. When his father died, Norman Chandler enjoyed the good life and the benefits of being the scion of an empire, but he was self-obsessed, indulgent, and lacked his father's drive and ruthless ambition. Norman Chandler became the publisher of the Los Angeles Times in 1945, but the newspaper that Norman published in the 40s and early 50s were merely the ultra-capitalist voice of the property holdings and political interests of the Chandlers and, their, and of cronies and influential friends. When the Black Dahlia case broke, the editors at the Times would have preferred to keep the hideous murder story on the back pages. However, they were compelled to put the story on the front page for a period of time to compete with the sensational Hearst coverage. Primarily printing Donahue's handouts, the Times had a few investigative reporters working the case, and much of what appeared in the Morning Times was simply a rehash of what happened in Hearst's Evening Herald Express or the previous day's examiner. Oh, you drink it. Perhaps in a moment, on January 17th, 1947, the Times publicly took credit for identifying the murder victim as Elizabeth Short with the announcement on page one that Captain Jack A. Donahoe, given the identification by the Times, launched an immediate investigation to trace the movements of the girl before she fell prey to the perverted sadism of a person who apparently tortured her before she died. 
However, many Angelinos were aware that the identification story had already appeared in the examiner on the previous day, and Richardson had his revenge by running an interview with FBI Borough Chief J. Edgar Hoover the following day. Uh, congratulating the examiner for assisting the FBI in the spectacular identification achieved under extraordinary circumstance. While Richardson, in his ruthless way, was far ahead of the competition on the Black Dahlia story, Aggie Underwood at the Herald Express had a reputation as a formidable crime reporter and was working, more, working her own leads. Although Aggie didn't like to think of herself as a crime reporter, she had covered most of the major murder cases in Los Angeles since 1940, 1936. Sorry. I wonder if this has um, something to do with Anne Rule as well, because she used to write for um, True Detective as a police officer. And because she was a woman, her name was Andy Stack. I'm just saying that because I just see that. I'll show you in a minute. Just a minute. Um, having stashed away all the cases in her mental murder file, she agreed with Detective Harry Hansen that there had never been a case in Los Angeles quite like the murder of Elizabeth Short. Yet there was something about the M.O. that rang a distant a distant bell and had Aggie searching her murder memory, murder memory morgue for a clue. It was Aggie who was responsible for discovering that Elizabeth Sharp was known in the shady dives of Hollywood and Long Beach as the Black Dahlia. In recalling how this discovery came about, Aggie stated, the Black Dahlia tag, which the case assumed was dug out one day when we were all combing blind alleys, and I was checking with Ray Geis, homicide detective lieutenant, for any strange fact that might have been overlooked. Later in the squad room, he said, this is something you might like, Aggie. I found out they called her the Black Dahlia around a drugstore where she hung out down in Long Beach. That's where she got the name. Okay, I didn't know that either. Aggie sent... Herald reporter Bevo Means out to Long Beach to check out Detective Geis's tip, and he discovered that around the bars of Long Beach and the dives of Hollywood, Elizabeth Short was called the Black Dahlia because of her jet black flowery hair and the slinky back clothes she wore. The Black Dahlia first appeared in the Herald Express on Friday, January 17th, and all the Los Angeles headline Hungry Press quickly gloomed over that name. Henceforth, Elizabeth Short would be known as the Black Dahlia. Though few people today knew who Elizabeth Short may have been, a passing reference to the Black Dahlia conjures up cinema noir, visions of a hauntress of the night stalked by a fiend in the sinister shadow land of Hollywood in the 1940s. So this is what brought that up, is this here. True Detective. It's a magazine, and it, October's edition over here it says 25 cents. So just reminding me, because uh, Andy Stack, and rule used to write for them. This feels like it's heating up. Okay, we're on chapter four now. And this one's titled Limbo. I want nothing to do with this, Cleo Short told Harry Hansen and finished Brown. The Texas have found Elizabeth's father living in an apartment in Los Angeles at 1020 South Kingsley Drive, less than two miles from where his daughter's body was discovered. The victim's 62-year-old father had only recently read the news that the mutilated body of Jane Doe No. 1 was identified as his daughter. But the detectives found Cleo to be strangely cold and indifferent to her brutal murder. I broke off with the mother and the family several years ago. Cleo said, what a piece of crap. My wife wanted it that way when I left the family. I provided a trust fund for their support. Five years ago, though, Elizabeth wrote to me, so I sent her some money. She came out here, and she lived at my house when I was living in Valley Joe. Or Valley Joe. It was reported in the Metropolitan newspapers that Elizabeth moved to California in 1943 to live with her father, who was working at the Mare Island Naval Base in San Francisco Bay Area. Reportedly, she only lived with her father for a month or two before they had a falling out that led to her departure. It is said that Elizabeth had begun dating a number of servicemen, and Cleo com complained that she was seeing a different boyfriend every evening and staying out very late, sometimes all night. A church-going Baptist, Cleo admonished Elizabeth for living a litigious life. 
She wouldn't stay home, Cleo complained. In 1943, I told her to go I told her to go her away, go her way. I'd go mine. After that, she headed south and worked at Camp Cook, and then she was arrested in Santa Barbara for juvenile delinquency. Hey, Benita. Though the police characterized Clue as uncooperative, Hanson and Brown eventually concluded that he had no relevance to their investigation and the full extent of the statements to the police has remained locked within the LAPD Black Dahlia files for more than 50 years. But Cleo had not been exactly forthright regarding the circumstances of his estrangement from his family or the events that occurred when his daughter visited him in California. I need to sit at my desk soon. <laughs> this is annoying. <laughs> That might be better. <clears throat> In 1930, Cleo had deserted. Cleo had deserted, deserted his wife Phoebe and their five children. His abandoned car was found on the Charleston Bridge near Boston. Cleo was simply disappeared. The police concluded he had jumped from the bridge and drowned in the rushing currents of the Charleston River. That's sick. It would be years before Phoebe and the children would learn that Cleo was alive and well living in California. During the boom years of the 1920s, Cleo Short had been in the business of building miniature golf courses in the Boston area. But with stock market crash of 1929 and the Great Depression, Cleo's business hit hard times. No longer able to support his family, he chose to abandon them leaving his wife Phoebe with the foreclosure of his business, angry creditors, and the problem of paying the rent and feeding and clothing their children. What a piece of crap. There was no trust fund, as Cleo had stated. Okay, so we lied about that. Figures. And life was very difficult for Phoebe and the children. Elizabeth was a third child of five girls born to Phoebe and Cleo Short. Elizabeth's younger sister, Muriel, was only two when Cleo disappeared. And she recalled, I didn't have a way of really missing him. But my sisters did, especially Ginny and Betty, which was Elizabeth. Sounds familiar, eh? I hate how they get away with that shit. Mm. Nobody knew what happened. Elizabeth was eight years old when her father vanished. And according to her mother, it was the beginning of her emotional problems. Unlike her sisters, Elizabeth had mood swings, emotional ups and downs. She was happy one minute, sad the next, Phoebe said. I guess she was what you would call a manic depressive. Unable to pay the rent, Phoebe moved with the children from their large pleasant house on Evans Street in Medford to a third floor walk up at 115 Salem Street, where the children had to share a bedroom. Depending on mother's aid and welfare handouts, Phoebe found occasional employment as a bookkeeper. To escape from their problems, she often took the children to the movies. Muriel recalled, I don't know why, but Betty and I were like mama. We loved the movies. Muriel remembered that Elizabeth always liked to make something special out of their trips to the movies and would dress up as if she was somebody important. Elizabeth especially loved seeing movies in Boston's ornate movie palaces with the huge fancy lobbies, uh, gilded ceilings, and crystal chandeliers. Yeah, Patty. It became part of her dream world, and she talked about going to Hollywood and becoming a movie star. According to Maria, Elizabeth and her older sister, Ginny, frequently fought over using the family radio. Ginny wanted to listen to the opera, and since Ginny was the oldest, that's what we listened to. But Betty would quarrel over the music. She didn't want to always hear the long hair stuff, neither did I. Betty liked popular music and show tunes. <clears throat> Another Dina Durbin is what people said about her. She wanted to dance. She wanted to jitterbug. Betty didn't want to listen to what... Listen to that... Caterwauling, as she called it. Caterwauling? Mary Passios, a schoolmate who lived around the corner from the Shorts apartment, recalled, Betty had always been very friendly and kind to me. She reminded me of Snow White because she was very pale, pretty, and had that same dark hair. Mary's younger brother, Bob, remembers Elizabeth as by far the prettiest of the five sisters. And she and she would turn heads whenever wherever she went. She liked to tease me 
she recalled, uh, uh, Patios recalled, she knew I was bashful and she liked to see me blush. Betty would say things like, we ought to go out dancing together and my face would turn crimson, but she was a nice girl. Yeah, I totally agree, Kay. Like what the, the least did? Didn't even tell the mother what really happened to her child. They decided to call and say, oh, your daughter won a, a fucking beauty pageant when in reality she was murdered? Mutilated? Like seriously? Elizabeth began having asthma attacks shortly after the family moved to the walk-up on Salem Street. I have no idea what a like what a walk-up is. I don't know. I've never heard tell that. Muriel remembered that sometimes the attacks were so bad that their mother would have to call the doctor in the middle of the night to give Elizabeth an adrenaline adrenaline shot. In February in 1939, she had to be sent to Boston Hospital for an operation to clear her lungs. The doctors told Phoebe that it would be better for her daughter to be in a milder climate during the wintry months. And in 1940, when Elizabeth was 16, Phoebe made an arrangement for her to stay with friends in Miami Beach during the winter. In Miami, she obtained a part-time job at a beach resort and wrote that she hadn't had an asthma attack or cold during the entire winter. Very little is known about Elizabeth's time in Miami. The family did not reveal where she stayed, what she did, or who she, she who her acquaintances had been. There were only the photos found in Elizabeth's memory book of identified companions and servicemen she met. Finnis Brown went to Miami in the course of the homicide investigation to trace her activities, where she stayed, where she worked, and who she knew. But his report was withheld in the homicide files. And little of what he learned was passed on to the public or the press. Really? I wonder why it's so no elevators only st I... it's such a weird thing to say just say an apartment building I mean I don't know it's just weird to me the language is weird but I guess that's how it was sometimes it's funny though a former Miami police officer believes Elizabeth may have initially stayed in the home of a relative of the Short family Philip Short, who was a lieutenant in the Miami Police Department in the early 1940s and was said to be connected with Mayor Lansky and syndicate operations in the Miami area. Down here it says, in 1948, Philip Short became the Miami Police Chief. In his 1950 testimony before Senator something and the Committee to Investigate Organized Crime, it became evident that Chief Short allowed Meyer Lansky and the syndicate to openly operate betting parlors and gambling casinos in the Miami area without police interference. So her family was in the mob and everything else. Like, this had to have been a hit. That's The more and more I read, the more and more I think that's what this was. They made an example of this poor girl. Yeah, it was a different way of speaking. I like it, though. Like, there's new words I'm hearing, and some of them are weird, and some are like, what? I just can't help but laugh. I'm going to show the photos on my community tab, like I said. Try and show you this one here. Apparently, this is a photo of Elizabeth Short as she looked... As she looked well a student at the Roberts Junior High School. I don't know. It's very... It's so hard to show. I will put it on my community tab though so you guys can see it. After her sophomore year, Elizabeth dropped out of high school and began spending more than just the winter months in Miami. She was in Florida when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and she began dating servicemen stationed in the Miami area and obtained occasional modeling jobs. Okay, so if she's dating servicemen, does that mean she's a prostitute? Or is she just like boys? Does it keep mentioning that? And I don't know if they're trying to like say it without saying that she's a prostitute, you know what I mean?
<clears throat> so she began dating servicemen stationed in Miami area and obtained occasional modeling jobs. No, we can't say that. Returning to Medford in the spring of 1942, Elizabeth worked as an usherette at the Tremont, one of her favorite Boston movie palaces, where she replaced a young man who had been drafted. When Elizabeth returned to Medford, she was no longer the innocent schoolgirl who had reminded Mary of Snow White. Eleanor Kurz, a friend of Elizabeth's older sisters, Dottie and Ginny, remembered that when Elizabeth returned from Miami, she wore heavy makeup and would often hang around a popular cafeteria on Salem Street, owned by Donald Griffin. Elizabeth had only recently returned from Florida in 1942 when Eleanor spotted her in Mr. Griffin's cafeteria. I remember I hadn't seen Betty in a while, and she was sitting very straight on a counter stool, furthest from the door, dressed to the minute in a leopard fur coat and a hat, Eleanor recalled. Betty had her legs crossed, and she wore dark stockings and suede pumps and a lot of makeup by Medford standards. She was in her teens, but looked older, sophisticated. She made me feel like a country bumpkin. I thought to myself, Dottie's kid sister sure has grown up. Although Mr. Griffin was quite a bit older than Elizabeth, Eleanor recalled there were rumors circulating in Medford that Mr. Griffin and Elizabeth were having an affair. Some people said that Mr. Griffin was Betty's boyfriend, Eleanor stated, but I think it was just that he wanted to help her in a fatherly way. When Elizabeth told Eleanor that she was doing some modeling in Miami, Eleanor told her, you could go far with your looks, maybe get in the movies. I would like to, Elizabeth said. Mr. Griffin thinks I can certainly do it. Mary Patios recalled that Elizabeth had a distinctive walk and heads would turn when she walked down the streets of Medford. Everyone always stopped what they were doing to watch Betty and the woman laughed with the way men looked at her and fell all over themselves. Betty doesn't miss a step, even in platform shoes, they recalled. Uh, Patios recalled her aunt remarking, she carries herself straight and tall, just like a model swinging and swaying all the way up Salem Street. A dozen years after Cleo had vanished and was presumed dead, Phoebe received a letter from him. Can you imagine? You think your husband's dead. He parks his car um, on a bridge. There's water below. And even the police are saying, yeah, he jumped. It's, he's, a part of, he's a suicide victim, right? And then he writes you a friggin' letter. I've, well, I, I don't know how it was back then, but I'd be definitely going to court getting all that back child support and even more money alimony and everything else like fuck that i think there were dances and single women would be able to mingle with movie service men it was a way men and women could meet that doesn't mean yeah okay so um i remember seeing that in many 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 movies of course i wasn't alive back then but there's many movies with that aspect in it the navy boys would come over and then there'd be like yeah dance and they, that would basically be like the women there the navy men or whoever the the men home from the war and that's how they would meet their husbands right something like that yeah legit ways to meet the opposite sex yeah it actually looked fun better than what do we do now go online and try and meet somebody yeah right no thanks i don't need to meet the next serial killer So a dozen, so a dozen years a dozen years after Cleo had vanished and was presumed dead, Phoebe received a letter from him. She was shocked to learn that Cleo was alive and working in the shipyards in Northern California. Hmm. In the letter, he tried to explain that he left because he hadn't been able to face up to their financial problems. No, you left her for another woman, liar, and she told you no baggage, nothing. She didn't want that. So nice try. And he hoped that Phoebe might forgive him and allow him to return to his family. Phoebe angrily responded that she no longer considered Cleo to be her husband and she could never forgive him. He was still dead as far as she was concerned. Good girl. She wasn't a hookah. She was a However, when Elizabeth learned that her father was living in California, she was overjoyed and began writing to him about her dreams of moving to sunny California and obtaining employment there. 
Cleo suggested that Elizabeth could stay with him at his house in Valley Ho until she could find a job. And if that was what she wanted to do, he would send her money for the train for train fare. According to Muriel, Phoebe had mixed feelings about the arrangement, but Elizabeth was insistent. Mary Hernan, a girl who lived next door to the shorts, remembered that all Elizabeth could talk about during the week before she left for California was Hollywood. I asked her if she was going to be a movie star, Mary called. She laughed and told me that's what she'd hoped to do. And if you wanted to be a movie star, it wasn't going to happen to you in Medford. She'd have to go to Hollywood. And so on. And so on an icy day in December 1942, Elizabeth Short boarded a train in Boston and departed for the land of sunshine and shadow. Elizabeth found that the sunshine and valley, I don't even know how to say that word, in sunny California was often obscured by fog and the valley the valley the bay area was long away from glitter, glittering glamour of movie land she tried to persuade her father to take her to south to los angeles for a visit but cleo thought her movie star dreams were foolish according to his statements in the press they had their falling out in january 1943 well, that was the month that she was murdered elizabeth headed south to camp cook and there had been no trip to Hollywood. However, according to the Black Dahlia files recently discovered in the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, Cleo had not told the whole story. Found among the archives of historic cases established by DA Steve Cooley was the testimony of Detective Harry Hansen before the 1949 grand jury investigator, Lieutenant Frank B. Jemison. In a statement, Hansen recalled that several days after the murder, the police had located Cleo's, several days after the murder, the police had located Cleo's Los Angeles address, and he and Finnis Brown had gone to Cleo Kingsley's drive apartment to question him. We knocked and knocked and knocked on the door and finally aroused him, Hansen stated. We found him to be in a drunken stupor, found wine bottles all over the place. He was very uncooperative, especially in view of the fact that, after all, his daughter had just been murdered. Hansen related to the grand jury that they decided to return the next day when Cleo was sober and questioned him at some length. They found that he had been living off and on with a Mrs. Yankee on Nebraska Street in California, where Elizabeth had journeyed to visit her father in December of 1942. Miss Yankee revealed to the investigators that Cleo's daughter had stayed in the Nebraska Street house for only several days before Elizabeth, Cleo, and Miss Yankee traveled south to Los Angeles, where they stayed at 1028 and a half West 36th Street for approximately three weeks in January 1943. And according to the DA's Black Dahlia files, when detectives checked with a Miss Monty, who still lived in the rear of that address, she confirmed their visit and had a clear recollection of seeing Elizabeth Short there with Cleo and Miss Yankee. According to Miss Monty, Cleo was an alcoholic and drunk. Cleo was an alcoholic and was drunk most of the time, and he and his daughter had many arguments over money and his drinking. While in Los Angeles, Elizabeth had met Chuck, a sergeant in the 6th Armored Division stationed at Camp Cook, north of Santa Barbara. Miss Monty recalled that on January 29, 1943, following an argument over her father's drunkenness, Elizabeth had left word that she was heading north to Camp Cook with the sergeant. When Cleo spoke to the police and the press in 1947, Alcal might have impaired his memory of the visit <clears throat> to Los Angeles with his daughter in January 1943 and the circumstances of Elizabeth's departure. Although Cleo had permanently re relocated to Los Angeles in 1945, he insisted that he had never seen or spoken to Elizabeth for the in the four years since she left for Camp Cook. Nevertheless, in Harry Hansen's statements to grand jury investigators, he made it clear that at one that at one time Cleo had been a suspect in the Black Dahlia murder. We found that Mr. Short was working on a refrigeration repairman or engineer in a store in Hollywood on Santa Monica Boulevard when the murder took place. However, we were satisfied after going to the store, seeing the employment records, the timesheets, checking up on various bars where he would go and drink after he was through with work, we were satisfied that he could be eliminated as a suspect. When it was discovered that Elizabeth Short had been working at a Camp Cook post-exchange, 
When he was arrested in 1943, reporters interviewed several Camp Cook employees who had known her. Inez Neeling, Keeling, an employee of PX Hashtag One, remembered that. Elizabeth had a childlike charm and beauty. She was one of the loveliest girls I'd ever seen, popular with many GIs at the camp. <clears throat> Elizabeth was voted cutie of the week. And an item in the camp newspaper cited her as the main reason for the steady increase of business at PX1. Investigators learned that Elizabeth had been living at Camp Cook with Chuck, the sergeant she had met in Los Angeles, and Chuck had threatened, threatened and beaten her. Elizabeth had filed a complaint with his commanding officer, and she tried to attach Chuck's paycheck and obtain damages, but damages were denied, and the and the sergeant was shipped overseas. Elizabeth then moved from the Army base to Vera Green's apartment on Montecito Street in Santa Barbara, where the indecent where the incident took place that led to her arrest on September 23rd, 1943, and the subsequent fingerprints and mug shots that led to her identification. While Jim Richardson was waiting on the examiner city room to hear from the reporters he had sent to Santa Barbara and San Diego, he was trying to get a fix on Elizabeth Short's life in Hollywood before she left the city. Where did she live? Who did she know? Did she have a job? How long has she lived in Los Angeles? Uh, Will Fowler recalled the examiner was tipped that Elizabeth Short had been living in an apartment near Hollywood Boulevard shortly before she suddenly left the city in December 1946. Richardson set out a team of reporters to work the Hollywood bars and nightclubs for leads. The examiner soon learned that the Black Dahlia had been a familiar figure in a number of Hollywood cocktail lounges, that she had been living at the Chancellor Apartments at 1842 North Cherokee Avenue, just north of Hollywood Boulevard. Reporters found Elizabeth Short's name still on the mailbox of apartment 501. There's actually a photo of it, her signature and stuff. Um, there were five other girls sharing the apartment, which was on top floor, on the top floor looking overlooking the street below. The building was managed by Glenn Wolf, a suspected narcotics dealer who recruited girls from the syndicate brothels. The landlady, Miss Juanita. Miss Juanita Ringo told the examiner that Elizabeth Short had moved into the apartment on November 13th, 1946, just two months prior to her murder, and she left so abruptly that it seemed she was afraid of something or someone. She looked tired and worried, Miss Ringo said. I felt sorry for her. Even when she got behind on the weekly rent, when I went up for the rent last December 5th, she didn't have it. I don't think she had a job. That night she got the money somewhere, but she suddenly left the next morning. I can see how much longer this is. So it's starting to hurt. Okay. Cheryl in Maryland, <clears throat> one of the girls who lived with Elizabeth Short in apartment 501, Told reporters that Miss Short left to roam Hollywood Boulevard and she'd be out with different with a different man every night. Linda Rohr, another 22-year-old roommate who worked in the makeup room at Max Factor, said that Elizabeth, whom she knew as Beth, seemed to be worried or afraid. She had a lot of telephone calls, mostly from a man named Maurice, and she was out almost every night. The morning she left, she was very anxious about something. Beth said to me, I've got to hurry. I've got to get out of here. Linda recalled that Elizabeth told her that she was leaving town to live with her sister in Berkeley. But her older sister, Jenny, who had moved to Berkeley after marrying university professor Adrian West, told investigators that she hadn't heard from her sister for some time and that no knowledge of an impending visit. Instead, Elizabeth headed south for San Diego. When examiner reporter Wayne Sutton spoke to Elizabeth's mother on the phone about the letter that her daughter had mailed from San Diego on January 8th, he had learned that the return address was 2750 Camino Pedro in Pacific Beach. Uh, examiner reporters Tom Devlin and George O'Day, who had been instructed by Richardson to check out the address and learn the identity of Red, discovered that the address was a residence of El Alvera French. Alvera. Alvera lived there with her 21-year-old daughter, Dorothy, and her 12-year-old son, Corey. Dorothy worked as a cashier at the Aztec Theater in downtown San Diego on 5th Street, not far from the Greyhound Bus Depot. On the night of December 9, 1946, the Aztec was playing the Jolson story, and Dorothy recalled that she was preparing to close up the theater 
during the end of the last show when she noticed a young woman who had fallen asleep in one of the front rows. Upon waking her, the girl apologized and told Dorothy that she had just arrived on the bus from Hollywood, was broke, and had no place to sleep. As they walked out to the street, she told Dorothy that her name was Beth Short. She said she had been an usherette at a theater in Boston, and she wondered if she can get a temporary job at the Aztec. When she said temporary, I thought it meant that she wasn't looking for a permanent job, Dorothy recalled, and that she didn't intend on staying in San Diego. I suggested that she talk to the manager the next day. There was something so sorrowful about her. She seemed lost and a stranger to the area, and I felt I wanted to help her. I wasn't sure how. She apparently had no place to stay. I suggested she come home with me and get a good night's sleep, if that would help. She said she was thankful for my generosity. Hey, country girl Brenda. Taking the local bus to Pacific Beach, Dorothy and Elizabeth got off at the intersection of Balboa and Pacific Coast Highway and walked up to the hill to the French, French's small housing project home, where Dorothy's mother, Elvira, Elvira, was still awake. I want to say Elvira, but it's Elvira. Having a snack in the kitchen. Introducing the unexpected guest, Dorothy explained that Elizabeth had no place to stay. Elvira remembered that she was pale and didn't look well. She brought Elizabeth a pillow and a blanket and suggested that she sleep on the sofa. The next morning, Dorothy's younger brother, Corey, went to the Greyhound bus depot and brought back the suitcases Elizabeth had left at the check room. He recalled that the suitcases were so heavy that he was sure they were filled with rocks until Elizabeth opened them and he saw they were crammed with fancy clothes. Miss French's husband had been killed in the war, and Elizabeth told her that she too was a war widow and that her husband, Major Matt Gordon, had been killed in a plane crash in India while flying for the Army's Air Force. She was married? She mentioned that she had a, a baby boy by him, but that the baby had died, Elvira recalled. She showed me a newspaper clipping she'd been keeping in her purse. She said it told about her and the major. Elizabeth's sad story engendered sympathy from Elvira and Dorothy French, and initially the Frenches believed that their house guest often wore black because she was a mourning for her dead husband and her baby. But her frequent late night dates and frivolous lifestyle seemed to believe that conclusion. It wasn't until the news about the murder of their former house guest appeared in the newspapers that they learned she had never been married or given birth to a child. Shit. Elizabeth told the Frenches she had been working in Hollywood on a movie extra and was expecting some money to be sent to her at the Western Union office. She said she was hoping to get a job in San Diego, and if she could stay over a day or two, she would be happy to pay for the inconvenience. Dorothy said, I told her that was not necessary. A lot of people were having a hard time, and housing and apartment storage was bad, and my mother who to also told her not to worry about putting us out, and whatever she needed, we'd be able to take care of it. But the day or two soon became a week, and the week soon became a month. The expected money wire never seemed to arrive, and instead of getting up in the morning to go look for employment, Elizabeth would stay out late at night, sometimes until 2 or 3 in the morning, and then sleep until noon. Her late dates, she said, were with prospective employers. Avera worked as a civil employee at San Diego Naval Hospital, and when she came home for lunch, she'd often find Elizabeth still sleeping on the sofa with her fancy clothes strewn around the living room and her exotic lingerie hanging over the furniture. There was a strong, sweet-smelling, flowery scent in the house from her perfume, Elvira, Elvira recalled. It was as though she had sprinkled perfume everywhere. She hadn't, of course. It was just the way of using it. Her clothes were quite expensive, especially the lingerie. They were brand new silk black silk stockings. I could tell they weren't nylon, but silk. Elizabeth, Because Elizabeth slept until noon, Elvira found herself tiptoeing around the house as she prepared herself breakfast and got ready for work. Soon she began wondering why she had to tiptoe around her own house when Elizabeth should have been out seeking employment instead of sleeping in late. It wasn't long before Elvira began slamming the door on her way out, and as the days went on, Elvira and Dorothy French would have arguments over the merits of sheltering Elizabeth. She had overstayed her welcome, as far as Alvera was concerned, but Dorothy felt sorry for her and kept persuading her mother to be patient for a little longer. Dorothy and Alvera both sensed that Elizabeth was in some kind of precarious limbo, almost as if she were hiding out. She was in the habit of chewing her fingernails down to the quick, and at times she seemed despondent and fearful, as though she had been in some kind of trouble before she left Hollywood. That's so strange. Can you imagine have somebody living with you? And they're always like that, chewing their fingers, always scared, always worried, always afraid. But yet, 
sleeps until noon, is out all night, has all these expensive clothes and lingerie and real silk stockings. I mean, she's such a mystery. It's like, I want to know everything. I need to know everything. I have to know. For me. <laughs> I don't know. I just don't want to know everything. It's just so many questions. The Frenches recall that Elizabeth had bad teeth that needed filling, but she didn't have the money to see a dentist. Instead, she kept a supply of paraffin candles and used the melted candle wax to disguise her dental problems before going out on a date or a job interview. Hmm. As a matter of econ economy, there was no phone in the French's house, and Elizabeth often used the neighbor's telephone or walked down the hill to the payphone at the corner store or the corner drugstore. She frequently talked about jobs she was pursuing and told the Frenches that she hoped to get a job at Western Airlines or perhaps at the Naval Air Station. She told Dorothy that the manager of the Aztec Theater was considering giving her a job as an usherette. One afternoon, she had an appointment with the theater manager and Elizabeth told Dorothy that she would meet her afterwards, but Elizabeth never showed up. She had dinner with Dorothy's boss instead and stayed out most of the night. The next day, Dorothy noticed that she had long red scratches on her upper arms. Elizabeth explained she had gone to the theater's manager's home for dinner. He had too much to drink, Elizabeth said, and he started grabbing for me and scratched my arms. Dorothy recalled that Elizabeth had never got a job at the theater, but despite the manager's behavior, she dated him again, along with other men she had met in the brief time she stayed with the Frenches. She sounds as if she's um, seeking male attention she like wants to be loved or maybe she was looking for a protector. I don't know. I have so many questions. Elvira and Dorothy noted that the sad soul who had seemed so lost in a stranger to the area was quite adept at quickly gathering a large coterie of male acquaintances. One of the acquaintances was Red, the mystery man who was to drive Elizabeth back to Los Angeles. When examiner reporters Devlin and O'Day questioned Elvira and Dorothy French about the identity of Brett, they recalled that one day in mid-December, Elizabeth had brought to their home an old acquaintance she had bumped into near the Western Airlines office in downtown San Diego. Elizabeth said he was an ex-Marine Corps flyer and referred to him as Red. She had told them that Red was now flying for Western Airlines and was helping her get a job there as a stenographer. According to Elvira, Elizabeth dated Red every night from December 16th to the 21st, and then he suddenly left town. Elvira remembered that Elizabeth went out with other men almost every night until Red returned in the first week of January to drive Elizabeth back to Los Angeles. Elvira and Dorothy both described him as a tall, red-haired, freckle-faced man in his mid-twenties. They recalled that his first name may have been Bob, but they didn't know his full name. Dorothy revealed that when Elizabeth suddenly decided to leave San Diego, she seemed disturbed and agitated, and Dorothy attributed it to an incident that had occurred on January 6th. Dorothy recalled that two days before Elizabeth packed up and moved out, some people came to her door and knocked. There was a man and a woman, and another man was waiting in a car parked on the street in front of the house. Beth became very frightened, and she seemed to get panicky and didn't want to see the people or answer the door. They finally went back to the car and drove away. Even our neighbors thought all of this was very suspicious. Where that Elizabeth had been frightened by the mysterious visitors, the Frenches tried to ask Elizabeth who they were, but she wouldn't want she didn't want to discuss it. Alvera believed it was after this incident that Elizabeth contacted Brad, who subsequently sent a telegram indicating he would be there on the following afternoon. In checking at the San Diego Western Union office, the reporters found that Red had sent the telegram from Huntington Park, a suburb of Los Angeles, on January 7th eight days before Elizabeth Short's mutilated body was found on Norton Avenue. Sounds like she was a sex worker autistic. But then why was she always broke? She couldn't pay rent. She never paid a dime to the French ladies. I mean, it's weird. When the examiner reporters phoned in their story, Richardson knew he had a scoop. Red may have been the, la the last person to see Elizabeth Short alive, knowing he had secured his exclusion. Exclusive, sorry. Richardson took two of the title. Two of the little. Yeah, you can tell him get. <laughs> Knowing he had secured his exclusive, Richards, Richardson took two of the little white nerve pills he 
was in habit of taking when the scoop cooker was coming to a boil and then picked up the phone to clue in Captain Donahoe about Red and Elizabeth Short's stay in San Diego. Donahoe agreed that Red was the prime suspect in the Black Dahlia murder and Richardson set the examiner headline for Saturday, January 18th. In checking the origins of the telegram to Elizabeth Short sent from Huntington Park, Detective Hansen found that the sender had to decline to give his full name or address. In checking with the San Diego office of Western Airlines, Detective Brown was told they had no employee in the San Diego area that matched the description of Red given by Alvera and Dorothy French. After interviewing the Frenches, Hansen and Brown proceeded to question the neighbors. Forrest Faith, who lived opposite the French's house, recalled seeing the mysterious man and woman who had frightened Elizabeth when they knocked on the French's door several days before her departure. He also observed Red when he picked up Miss Short in the late afternoon of January 8th. Faith said he saw a tall fellow with red hair parked near his home at about 6 p.m. The man put the girl's bags in the car's turtleback, Faith recalled. She didn't seem to be afraid then. They were laughing and joking together. Faith gave Hanson and Brown a detailed description of the car, and the detectives sent out an all-points bulletin for Red, the number one suspect in the murder of the Black Dahlia. Suspect described as a white male, American approximately 25 years, 6 feet, 175 pounds, red hair, blue eyes, and light complexion. He's known as Red or Bob. Car is described as being possibly a 1940 stud Studebaker coupe cream or light tan in color bearing California license number with one digit preceding the letter V. If cars located hold for fingerprints and all occupants and notify sergeants F.A. Brown or Harry Hansen homicide division. But by the time all, all the all points bolts and police bulletin had been broadcast Richardson had already succeeded in finding Red the suspected werewolf killer of the Black Dahlia. Hmm. Werewolf killer of the Black Dahlia. That's okay. Here's another photo here. Like I said, I will put these in my community tab because I know I like looking at them. They're hard to see. All right, I'm going to stop there. There's two more chapters down. Now we're on chapter five and I will continue reading um, this on Thursday. So every Thursday and Sunday I'll do uh, we'll read we'll read the Black Dahlia. I know I like this book. But my back and my ass, I think, are numb and they're hurting. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this couch is not very comfortable. It's old. It's I don't even know how old this thing is, but it's old. That's my next thing. I need to get another, I need to get a couch. Hopefully they have like a rent home couch place because I need one. Hey, Navo. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I'll be back Thursday for sure. I'll put the, uh, oh my God, I keep don't feel like talking anymore. It's like, bleh, but I will for a few minutes. Um, So for Thursday and Sundays, I'll be doing the Black Dahlia lives. So I'll make sure I put up the, the lives so you guys know ahead of time. And then Monday, I'm going to read um, The Staircase. Country Girl Brenda bought me that book. So thank you again. And I start that on Monday because now I want to read that one too. So you know what? Why not read two? I was doing that before. I was reading Helter Skelter and then I was reading... Uh, Tears of Rage, that animal story. All right, I'm going to get off here. Jason. Okay, so I'll be back tomorrow then with a book. <laughs> Tomorrow's Monday. Hey, Suzanne. Oh, really? I'm obsessed with this. I don't know what it is. It's just, I found this book and it was on Amazon. And it's like, it's called the Black Dahlia Files. It has everything in it, like stuff that nobody even knew. So it's got me so intrigued and so interested. 
So every Monday and every Sunday. All right, you guys have a good night. I'll be back tomorrow with, um, I guess, the start of the staircase. And then uh, I need to figure out uh, what I'm going to do for the rest of the week. I know I need to catch up with that YouTuber. I don't want to, but I have a lot to say. Oh, and check out Suzanne's uh, video. You saw it on Hollywood Babylon. Um, check out her, you saw her video. I did post it in the community tab. Uh, stuff that that YouTuber has been saying, um, once again, Suzanne had to make another video. I think, how many videos is this now? A hundred will go, we'll say. To prove a point that she's lying. Not Suzanne, but, you know, that YouTuber is lying. So anyways, check out her video. And then check out the one I also posted um, of Nimi Marie. Because I did have to, that's why I said on top of it, I'm like, this is why I love her. It's good. It's all these bloopers and stuff. Oh my God, it just made me laugh. <laughs> it was good. All right, I'm going to shut up. You guys have a great night. I'll be back tomorrow at 7 p.m. Yeah, too many, exactly. All right. Bye, guys.